If you have your Bibles, if you'd open them. If you're in the marriage study, I'll use the word penultimate chapter of 1 Samuel. That is the second to last chapter of 1 Samuel. We have been walking a journey, and we have two chapters remaining, chapter 30 and chapter 31. God has been walking alongside Saul, and then not so much, as Saul has not walked alongside God. And God has been walking alongside David, and even as he has done so, he has chastened David. He has worked with David. David has shown himself very much human in the process. And yet God's work in bringing this next king to fruition is not yet done, but will be completed because of who God is and not who David is. We're going to read chapter 30. It's a little longer. Um, If you have your place, if you would stand, let's read it together. Just by way of reminder, David had gone with the armies of the Philistines to go into battle um, against Israel, and the Philistine leaders had said, you can't do that with us, even though Achish loves you and thinks the world of you, go home. And so that's what they do, and this is where we pick up the narrative. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag, that's where they were living, on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag, and had overthrown Ziklag and had burned it with fire. They took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. And then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. What a line. David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, please bring me the ephod. And so Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he, God, said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. So David went, he and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, and where they left those behind, where those who left behind, excuse me, where those left behind remained. But David pursued, he and the four hundred men, for two hundred men who were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor remained behind. Now they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate and they provided him water to drink and they gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins and he ate and then his spirit was revived and he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. We made a raid on the Negev of the Shedratites, and on that which belongs to Judah, and on the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, will you bring me down to this band? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down to this band. So when he brought him down, behold, 
They were spread over the land, all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. David slaughtered them from the twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. But nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that they had taken for themselves. David brought it all back. So David had captured the sheep and the cattle, which the people drove ahead, and the other livestock, and they said, this is David's spoil. When David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David, who had also been left at the brook Bezor, they went went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. Then David approached the people and greeted them, and all the wicked and worthless men among them. Those who went with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered except to every man, his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. And David said, you must not do that. You must not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us, who has kept us and delivered into our hand the band that came against us. And who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And so it has been from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoils to the elders of Judah to his friends, saying, Behold, a gift for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord to those who were in Bethel and to those who were in Ramoth of the Negev and to those who were in Tatir and to those who were in Aori and to those who were in uh, Sifmoth and to those who were in Estamoa and to those who were in Rakal and to those who were in the cities of the Jeremilites. And to those who were in the cities of the Kenites, and to those who were in Horma, and to those who were in Bor Ashan, and to those who were in Athak, and to those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to go. Pray with me. Father, speak your word again now, not through your people, but through your word. Through me as your servant, your message, help each one of us to hear and to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to dive into the passage because we sang a song about here in your presence, I'm completely undone. Um, As I look at this story, we're going to reach a moment for David where he is completely undone and it's in a little different manner. Not overwhelmed and just in awe, but absolutely overwhelmed by his scenario and his circumstances and his consequences and undone. But we're going to see a restoration. And so the the title of the message is Restored from Ziklag. We're going to see God now begins to move. Reaching the end of one chapter, we're about to start another book all together, and its central figures are going to shift. He who is in leadership is going to shift. And so the first thing I want you to see is God is willing to let us become completely undone. God is willing to let us be completely undone. I want you just to journey where we are right now with David in the moment as we begin chapter 30 and we read these first six verses. Wandering now for years with this band of misfits, narrowly avoiding capture and death, he's been lying through his teeth to do what he thought best to preserve himself, and now he's returning from his latest deceptions, providentially spared of unthinkable betrayal. He makes the 60-mile journey home. He's tired, he's weary, he's likely a little relieved, but as the city comes into view... The smell of smoke and a landscape of silence 
and ash greet him. David has become now, at this very moment, a man without kingdom, without direction, without integrity, and now without city, possessions, and even immediate family. Verse 4. And so they lifted up their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Have you, have you ever been in a moment like that? Where you've cried so much you're too tired to cry more? Where you just got to the end and all you were was hurt? Where all of the emotion, all of the circumstances of life just basically have confronted you and just left you broken? For all of their dodging, for all of their evading, for all of their labors, for all of their trying to carry and care for their family in constant flux, so often on the run. Now, these men have reached a moment where seemingly all is lost. It seems even deeper than places, people, and possession. In one sense, it almost feels like their identity is lost. Who are these men? I mean, are they, they Philistines? They were about to go to war. Or are they Israelites? They didn't even know whose side they belonged to? Was everyone against them? Was anyone for them? Who did they have left to trust? You can imagine this group of men, exhausted, left sitting staring at ashes. And what do they do? They turn to David. What kind of leader is this guy? What has he accomplished for these men and their families? All this time together, and now we have even less to show for it. Weeping quickly turns to bitterness and resentment. Those who have those painful emotions have them now found a new home in focused blame on David. The men decide to take it out on him, and from protecting him, they move to stoning him. Can you imagine the duress that David is now under, how undone he must feel, how unraveled his life has become. And you can imagine the mental battle that he is undergoing, the enemy accusing him, failure, look at the results of your craftiness, all is lost and it's all your fault. You'll never be a king of a nation, you can't even care for a few hundred men and their families. By your incompetence, you've brought them to ruin. You ever had a battle in the midst of failure? The circumstances present themselves, and boy, the attacks begin. God was willing to bring David to a moment of great pain and agony, and David was certainly in that. Everything around him was falling apart. But I want you to go to the next point, and that's this. We always have the choice in how we're going to respond when our worlds collapse. We always have the choice in how we're going to respond. Greatly distressed, but David is willing neither to blame nor abandon God. Look at the rest of verse 6. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It was as if the guys who numbered the verses, because they didn't originally have numbers, it was like the guys who originally numbered th these verses knew how loudly the narrator was speaking. The despair was not going to be the end of the verse because David wasn't going to stay there. He would strengthen himself in the Lord, his God. God allowed him to reach the bottom. In chapter 21, he had become an apparent lunatic. In chapter 23, his steps from being caught by Saul were absolutely infinitesimal. In chapter 25, he was stopped by a cunning woman or would have gone on a revenge killing spree. In chapter 27, he was lying through his teeth, brutally killing to cover his tracks. In chapter 28, to keep up his image, he was willing to go to war with his kinsmen. And now after being kicked off of that plan, he returns to everything that seems to be lost. But he knows all isn't lost because he knows God hasn't left him. He knows God's promises are still true. God's presence with David was still real. 
Though God had brought him low and stripped him of everything, God would still be at work. He would allow David to be broken. But since we know the rest of the story, we also see that it was all in preparation for what would soon come next. God was preparing his servant and wanted his heart and mind dependent on him and tuned in to him. He was going to be faithful to bring about his promises and his plans. He was going to be faithful to mold this next king into the one who would lead. And so with nothing to show for himself, David turns back to the Lord and strengthens himself in the Lord. So what does it mean to strengthen yourself in the Lord? Well, we have similar verbiage given to us in chapter 23 when Jonathan comes and visits David. And it says that Jonathan strengthened his hand in God. Well, how did Jonathan do that? So let's look real quick at how Jonathan did that. In verse 16, Jonathan comes to him and reminds David of truth. He says, do not be afraid. You will not be killed. You will be king. Saul will not find you and kill you. Jonathan reminded him of God's promises. He reminded him of God's call on his life. Then he reminded him of God's hand in all of it, even though it was hard. But I want you to also know, in those promises, there's not a Jonathan here speaking. Jonathan isn't there to speak and strengthen him. It says that David strengthened himself. It's an active thing that David has to do. David chooses what he's going to accept as reality. He can accept all the lies that have just been fed to him, or he can choose to believe what God has already said. I think back again to the ladies' truth-filled Bible study. David has an opportunity for self-talk as he is facing the ledge. And it's as if in this moment he says, wait, God, I know that you are. I know that you've spoken, that you've given counsel to me. I know you've led me and you've saved me numerous times. You have been faithful. You've been good. You've been just. You've stripped me of all my confidence in myself. I have nothing to show for my independence other than my own skin, which, in fact, you've preserved. And yet in your grace, in your kindness, you do what you please and you have already declared that you're not done with me. You've chosen to establish my household in Israel and me as her king. Because of your promises, I know you're not done. I know you're with me. Even in this, you are my God. Notice what it says. He strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. He had a relationship with the Lord. And so he, with everything or with anything he had left, he came to the Lord And said, I'm yours, and you're still mine. Now what? It's a beautiful picture here where all of his men are going one direction. In the midst of that moment, David says, I will not go there. Because I know God is true. And his men have opportunity to now watch a man led by the Lord. You see what happens next is interesting. In his strengthening, David calls out for the Lord to help. It's as if he lifted up his eyes over the city and realizes something. Wait a minute. There are no dead bodies. What had he been doing? He'd been going to every city that he had been raiding, and they kind of wiped out everybody covering lies. But he looks, nobody's dead, which means what? There's hope. And so he looks to the Lord. The thing I want you to see is this. The Lord begins restoration as we rightly seek him. The Lord begins restoring David as he rightly seeks him. David calls for the ephod. That hasn't been around since chapter 23. And look what it says. God answers him. Verse 8 announces that God speaks. Should we pursue? Yes, you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. All wasn't lost. God had now said that as well. And in fact, God said all could be restored if they but went. 
And so I love verse 9. And so David went. Like, he's in this moment, great despair. Everybody is panicked. Everybody wants to turn on him and kill him. He gets a word from the Lord and he says, guys, we're going. It's time to go. The Lord is going to bring us this restoration. Rightly seeking the Lord, strengthen himself in the Lord is the only then response that is appropriate is obedience. We, we don't rightly seek the Lord if we're not willing to obey what we hear. When a sovereign God speaks, obedience isn't negotiable, optional, or delayable. It becomes obligatory and immediate. And that's just what this is here. Tired from a journey home, exhausted by the emotional anguish, yet they head out. It does prove too much for about a third of his men. They get to the brook, Bezor, and they say, David, we, we just can't go any further. And David says, that's fine. 200 stay. We're going to continue on. Next thing I want you to see is this. God continues to quietly work, even through the most obscure of events. Verse 11, now they find an Egyptian in the field. They bring him to David. Now listen to this. This guy doesn't speak for like a couple of verses. What does he get instead? It's like a full course meal and like the pampered treatment. Like he gets uh, bread and he ate and water to drink. They give him pieces of fig cake, clusters of raisins. He eats all of this and then his spirit is revived because he, the narrator knows he hasn't eaten or drank for three days or nights. And at the end of this, David comes and says, okay, who are you? God says, my master left me here three days ago when I fell sick, presumably to die. David extends grace to help this one, and David's mercy allows three or 200 men to stay back to be cared for where this one was left to die, and now this one in this fortuitous moment, becomes the path for restoration. The Egyptian becomes the roadmap where David had none. This Egyptian shares a backstory knowledge that David could only have suspected. He clarifies and rightly implicates the raiders. Now we know them to be the Amalekites, which the narrator had known at the beginning, but David did not. This Egyptian becomes the willing vessel to bring about the confrontation of the two parties as long as his neck is spared. Just, do you... Do we see, even without having the clarifying words, now God put in the path of, the, of the, the, the group an Egyptian who both knew who the raiders were and where they were returning to. Do, do we need to see that to know that God is at work completely orchestrating this moment? God has David set out, and David just sets out, and luckily, or maybe by hunch, in a given direction, But the beat had grown cold. It had been days since the raiding had been done. No one was left to tell them who had done it or what direction they had fled. And yet, God clearly brings a tossed aside sickly Egyptian into view so that David can care for his neighbor and reap the rewards of insight and direction. The Amalekite has been, the Amalekites have been out raiding. Not just Ziklag. They've been in the Philistine area, the Judean area. They had stopped now thinking themselves safely out of harm's way, and now David and his men are led right to them as they dance and celebrate and feast. They have no clue that that left-to-die slave has now been the one who's led back David. And so David and his men use the element of surprise and wipe out the Amalekites. This was rather a large band. We have no idea what the number was. It says they wiped out every single one of them except for 400 who got away. How many did David have total? 400. And 400 seems to be the guys that got away for the Amalekites. This was a large group of men that David has happened upon, but they're absolutely convinced that the Lord has directed their steps, and so they get to this moment, and it is now time that they go into battle. They've got to be exhausted, but it says from twilight to the end of the next day, like they, they just keep going in the Lord's strength, and the Lord brings a great deliverance. Let's not miss what God does. In his abundant grace, God restores graciously. 
Verse 18, they recover all that the Amalekites had taken, rescued his two wives. Nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, son or daughter, spoil or anything that had been taken for themselves. It's seemingly that everything even illegitimately raided for by David was still returned to him. Like this is an absolute complete restoration. And then it's more so because he captures all the sheep and the cattle, which the people have drove ahead of the other livestock. And everybody says, give that to David. So now he's not just gotten back what Ziklag had, had taken, but all the other places. Now they've got all of those things given to them. God absolutely graciously restores David and his men and everything to them. But then there comes a conversation. Next thing I want you to see is this. We must never forget where the victory comes from. When David came to the 200 men who were exhausted and he meets them, they come out to greet him. I love what the narrator introduces in verse 22. All the wicked and worthless men, let's define them before they speak. Just so you have any confusion as to what is about to take place and my opinion thereof and the Lord's opinion thereof. They speak up because they didn't go with us. They can have back their wives and kids, but that's it. That's all they get. Go away from us. What is the implication? They're looking at David saying, listen, we pushed through. We risked our lives while they slept and stayed clear of harm's way. We were the ones who were strong, who fought and cleaned house. We are the heroes. They are not. We deserve the credit. They can have their wives back because to the real victors go the real spoils. Commentator Davis says this, as troublemakers, no, I'm not reading that passage yet, but I'm going to be there in just a second. Troublemakers function on a philosophy of works that is always impressed with its own contributions. A philosophy of works that's always impressed with its own contributions. It makes sense and sounds logical provided one never lifts their eyes to look to the hills and ask where from is their help. Let's do a biblical rewrite of verse 22 and verse 23. Some of the men come to David and suggest how he might compensate his men for their efforts. To each man, David and his leaders would distribute according to the valor and performance rendered. To those who had done great feats, great gifts of gratitude would be offered. To those who could do little, even those who failed to make it to the battle lines, they received in proportion to their contribution. Yet all rejoiced as gifts were given fairly, and the victory was meritoriously shared by all. Um, can I just say that that's a lot of times how we act? I, I work the hardest, I get the biggest piece of the pie. I, I did this, you did that, mine was more important, so I get the bigger pat on the back. I get the bigger name recognition. But I think this is a beautiful picture of David's heart and what he's learned. David's response is different. It's grace. It wasn't what they did, but what God gave. Look at how David actually answers in verse 23. No, 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 guys. Don't do this, because this is what the Lord has given us, who's kept us and delivered into our hands this band that came against us. Davis goes on in this long quote, and I'm going to read it, but I want to put it up there. The difference between grace and works is the difference between worship and idolatry. The man, inebriated with the thought that all he has is Yahweh's gift, finds himself repeatedly on his knees, adoring, thanking, and praising. But if we do not grasp grace, we plummet into idolatry, for that is the inevitable colliery of self-sufficiency. So grace must also always be the decisive and dominating factor in the Christian's practical theology. He or she must constantly confess that this success or this employment or this loved one, this health, this meal is what Yahweh has given us. Every Christian then has no choice 
you must be a good theologian who both speaks and lives a theology of grace. You will find it humbling, but it is the only thing that will keep you from worshiping yourself. Do you really want to be, at the end of the day, ultimately rewarded for your performance? Because I can flash forward to you, for you, to Revelation chapter 20, where all of man will stand before the great white throne. And this is what the Bible says will happen at the end of time. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whom whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and that they were all judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone's name not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is a picture of works. And grace. Let's be careful how quickly we want to hold on to works and performance. David has learned that works don't get you there. And he recognizes as he looks out among those that are being met, who could not make it all the way, that he was going to be gracious. Thursday night I attended a ministry called Reset. They had a banquet. And one of the speakers who Um, was one of the founders of the organization, shared some things that he had learned while he was there. And he said, one of the things that I learned was those who have gone through the program are so much more generous than I am. He said, I'll be honest and I'll be vulnerable in this moment. He said, what I do is I look at someone and, and I think, are they worthy for me to help them out? And so if I have someone who's been going through the program and they blow it again, I have to stop and go, are they worthy still enough that I will help them? And he said, but then I go to the guys that are in the program and they're just like giving and they shouldn't be giving because they don't have near what I have. And yet they give and they give. Why? It's because they've experienced grace. And they understand that life is hard. And so they're quick to come alongside those in need. Because they don't want to be judged by their performance and they know that the other person needs grace. And so here David, as a good shepherd, corrals this easily frayed band of men, announcing in his wisdom, in his divinely directed gratitude, and his reclaimed voice of authority, you must not do this. Who will listen to you in this matter? The one who goes down into battle and the one who stays behind will share, and they will share alike. And I love what verse 25 kind of reminds us. There's a foreshadowing. It's been this way forward. This is a statute and an ordinance for who? For Israel to this day. David on the battlefield against the Amalekites made profound statements of grace that have affected his kingdom before he even got there. They came in with his heart because they came through his experiences. Final thing, generosity fuels others, both in mutual heart and common victory. This must have been the band of men to David as we look at the ones that have now celebrated. This bands them all together. David doesn't stop there, though. And the narrator takes time to, like, list all of these places. David deemed the spoils even more substantial than his own men should keep. 
In fact, remembering the words of the Egyptian, David knows that some of the present spoils were first plundered from the losses now faced by his Israelite kinsmen. And so he sends some of those things back. Why does the narrator take time to enumerate all the cities? To all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to going. I think there's something that's that's happening. Forgive my Lion King reference, but Simba is alive and he's returning home. He has been exiled. He has been out. The question is, where is David? What is happening? The Philistines are about to come in and ransack Israel. What will become of the nation? And here the message is being sent. God has been working in me. I have not forgotten you. I am with you and I will be coming. In this most recent exodus, maybe perhaps David senses the changing of the winds. Maybe he's just been confronted by his sin in exile and knows he cannot continue in this deception and fear. Maybe God has once again raptured his heart and his attention in worship. And it's to the nation of Israel that he must return. But he had left those strongholds in Israel not so strong when he departed from them. And he had left them to be raided. And these gifts would encourage them with a restoration of their own and invite them to celebrate a victory. Because this enemy wasn't just an enemy of David. This enemy was an enemy of God. And they were joining in in the celebration. There's just one remaining hurdle. That's the present king with whom we will deal with in a couple weeks. Chapter 31. Three quick applications. God cares more about your end than your means. I need you to hear this. Um, Like God is absolutely fine with blowing up your world because he cares more about who you are that you know him, because one day you will be in an eternity. And that eternity doesn't end. This life does. 70, 80, 90 years, maybe 100. Maybe it's cut short way too soon. But he knows ultimately that his promise is to conform us into the image of his son, And that he delights to have this relationship with you. And so he might send you through absolute struggle and agony so that you will release the things of this world and turn your affection and your gaze to him. God is a God who let David reach the bottom of bottoms. But in so doing, he was crafting a heart responsive to him, filled with gratitude, reflecting the good shepherd's care and concern, one who is demonstrating a readiness to be king. And can I just tell you, wherever you are, God is doing a similar thing in and on you. And he will be unashamed in taking you through the ringer if that's what is necessary to bring you to that predetermined end of looking like Jesus. And so I want you to be encouraged that the world seems to be falling apart around you even if it's a result of your own sin, that it's God in the moment that allows you to turn to him. And that in that moment, God may do a greater work in you and through you than you've ever seen before. Second thing is this, it's good to practice faith before reason. David left to search for the raiders without clear direction and even with an identity of who they were. Guys, I just want to parlay that with what we just did, asking the Lord before we even know who's willing to go and how we are going to get there and how we're going to do it. We ask the Lord to tell us, are we supposed to go to Poland or not? There was another way we could have done it. We could have said, everyone who's able to go, would you please write down your availability Everyone who's able to provide for it, would you write down those things? Okay, it rationally makes sense. We can pull this off. But it it is right for us to practice faith over reason. To put our trust that the Lord works and then we respond. There are times where he opens it up and shows us things are very clear. But sometimes he does that in a supernatural way. A faith-driven way. Not just a practical response way. 
He calls us to be his people, to be led by his spirit. And the last one is this. God's grace now is a foretaste for someday later then. I love how this picture of David being absolutely undone is more than blessed in what God restores to him. Can I just walk you through the New Testament picture? Ephesians chapter 2. We are by nature enemies of God, under the wrath of God, children of God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Verse 4 says, but God rich in mercy, the love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ And he does this for something. Verse 7 is so powerful. He says, he raises us up with him, seats us with him in heavenly places, so that in the ages to come, he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. Do you get that? Like, even if he lumps on you forgiveness, restoration, healing, Blessings in this world, they are a mere foretaste of one day what it's going to look like when you are in an eternal home with him in heaven in a restored new earth where there is no sin and all things become for his glory and for our blessing. Like that is an amazing thought. We are so enamored by this world and we're so short-sighted by the things here. That when our world falls apart, we think everything's lost. Friends, let me just remind you. Because of what Jesus Christ went to on a cross. And when we thought all things were lost. No, no, no. He rose again. He changed lives that to this day influence and continue to change lives. Because he is alive. And his spirit is at work. Praise God for restoration. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the work that you're doing in this body. Thank you for the message that you have for us. Father, thank you for the story of David, for the way that as we think about who this man was and all of his failures and all the moral issues that we could get into, yet one thing is true. You loved him without merit. You set your affections on him because you made him and you chose him and you wanted to make him the king and you have called us also in Christ that you have set your affections on us and you love us. And so you're willing to let us go through the ringer so that we look to you for that love. God, may we be found undone, whether by our circumstances in complete failure and shame finally wrestled to turn to look to you or may we be found undone still now in your presence having faced our own limitations and our own failures but now undone by the grace that more than and overcomes all of that that was before we're undone one way or the other it is the same that was true of written of christ that we have two options we will We will be broken. We will either fall broken on the rock or we will be crushed by the rock. Like, that is the only choice. Angels around your throne never stop because they're in wonder. May we be people who remain in wonder and allow you to continue to do your work. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.